So welcome everyone to the first episode of the Bridge Project's New Age Development and Diplomacy series, where we try and unpack new opportunities and challenges in the field of foreign policy and global cooperation. And today we are very pleased to have with us His Excellency Ambassador Manoj K. Bharti, who is a seasoned diplomat with years of experience cutting across the domains of foreign policy, trade and commerce, and technology. He assumed charge as the Ambassador of the Republic of India in Indonesia in the beginning of this year. He is an officer of the 1998 batch of the Indian Foreign Service and served as Additional Secretary, Administration and Economic Diplomacy and States from 2018 to 2020. He has also held the position of Special Secretary, Administration. His previous ambassadorial postings include in the Ukraine, Belarus, Iran, Holland, Nepal, Turkey and Myanmar. Ambassador Bharti also served in the Ministry of Commerce, Government of India, where he handled economic relations and foreign trade issues with Central European countries. And prior to this, he headed the e-governance and information technology division of the ministry from 2008-2011. So many thanks for joining us uh, on this podcast, sir. You're welcome. And uh, um, I welcome all those who are joining this podcast for this uh, special event. I just wanted to clarify, maybe there was a slip of tongue I am from 1988 batch, not 19. Okay. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, we can uh, maybe edit out that uh, you know, in the final kind of file. Yeah. Uh, but you know, just to set the context of you know today's conversation. Uh, so what we are planning to do is discuss you know aspects of India's development partnership and diplomatic engagements with uh, Indonesia, where you posted, uh, but also delve into wider ranging conversation on you know how India's national. Uh, level initiatives, uh, how state and city level governments and even the private sector can be leveraged in the diplomatic efforts and also the youth uh, and what role can they play uh, in kind of furthering ties between the two countries. Uh, so what we are essentially looking at is, uh, you know, moving from a whole of government approach to a whole of society approach, like, you know, in uh, the Indian diplomatic space. So uh, we can explore levers of public policy, economic diplomacy, subnational diplomacy, etc. Uh, which you know further India's foreign policy objectives at the same time. So, uh, Ambassador, before we um, get into the crux of the conversation, I actually wanted to know, uh, you know, how has the COVID nineteen pandemic changed uh, things for you from a professional standpoint? Uh, you know, in terms of you know how you managed interactions with different stakeholders in the Indian government, the diaspora, the Indonesian public. So, how has that been like over the past one one and a half years? Uh you mentioned about one and a half months actually i will say that this has been a much longer period which is uh, actually uh, from march last year i would like to comment on uh, my stay here since the middle of january this year which is basically six months period one of the main jobs of a diplomat is to maintain and nurture relationships. Right. That is done primarily through uh, meetings, exchange of you know visits, and uh, you know, addressing a large number of gathering of people. Of course, during this COVID times, this has been very hard to maintain this. Even though uh, we had a lot of restrictions, I can give you uh, some examples of what I did after I came here. Because at that time, uh, from February onwards, when I presented my credential to the governor, to the president of Indonesia, I made it a point to move to different regions and different uh, uh, provinces of Indonesia on a regular basis during these months before this peak uh, came in indonesia in the period of february march april and may i have visited five different uh, provinces which you can say as five different states in india hmm. and met with different governors different uh, city mayors uh, chambers of commerce university Generally, as an ambassador, wherever I have been, as you mentioned, Belarus and Ukraine, it has been my practice to go to universities and interact with young people on an extensive basis. 
wherever I used to go, I will address a gathering of 200 students, have a special session with them on, for example, in Ukraine, India-Ukraine relationship, India's own special features. And this is something which I have missed terribly here. I would have loved to continue that tradition. And one of the direct impact has been my inability to meet with younger people and exchange ideas with them. Hmm. There have been other restrictions also, of course, in meeting uh, dignitaries, different ministers, different uh, uh, leaders of society. Um, I managed to get a large number of meetings face to face during the first four months of my operation. But in the last two months almost, or one and a half months, this has been absolutely impossible. And we have had uh, virtual meetings with finance minister and, and agriculture minister and many such people. Um, I would say that in the current phase of Indonesia's surge of COVID-19, it is quite a challenging task for a diplomat to operate. There are only certain things that can be done and there are a large number of things that it is almost uh, impossible to even touch upon. We would love to have our Indian culture demonstrated through different means. We have a cultural center here. We have a, a extensive press and information center. All those interactions are almost on hold for the moment. So these are some of the specifics that I would like to share with you. Sure, sir. Um and you know, as you rightly pointed out, the COVID pandemic has been uh, quite a bit of challenge, especially for the embassies that have had to coordinate a lot of the relief effort uh, you know, with, yeah. with different stakeholders. Uh, but I want to take you back to a couple of years ago when, uh, or maybe even further back when uh, you were at the MEA and you served in different capacities. Uh, so what was particularly interesting to me was the division on economic diplomacy and state governments. Uh, again, uh, an aspect that we would like to focus on at the Bridge Project. Uh, going forward because this has really decentralized the foreign policy apparatus uh, yeah. as we uh, have known it. So I wanted to know uh, if you can maybe give us uh, a brief uh, overview of what this division does and what were some of those key roles uh, that you had taken on. Uh, economic Diplomacy Division was started I think uh, about five years ago and uh, the whole thinking behind uh, creation of this new division was to uh, uh, implement the new reality that countries do not relate to each other so much on political basis these days, but it is based on economic considerations. If two countries find uh, economic complementarities, their political relationship takes shape accordingly. There was a need to spread this uh, notion in different parts of the government of India itself to emphasize that foreign ministry, Minister of External Affairs in India, is gearing to the new realities of diplomacy in the world. And it really served a very useful purpose. After a few years, I think three years ago, uh, when um, uh, Sushma Sarajji was our external affairs minister, the thought, the thinking was that in our economic diplomacy, much of the importance is to be given to the role of states, their economic uh, strengths, and the need to link them with foreign uh, businesses, foreign governments, foreign provincial governments, and so on and so forth. With that in mind, that the economic diplomacy should be taken from the center to the states, the states division was created. And it was merged with the economic diplomacy division. The main idea, as I said earlier, was to interact with the state stakeholders. For example, Minister of uh, State Minister of Agriculture, State Minister of Industry, State Minister of Small Scale Industries. All these people um, 
and many other examples you can take of different ministries uh, mm. wishing to set up links with foreign countries and foreign powers and foreign businesses. This proved to be a very uh, effective way to bring this to the fore. Mm. Simultaneously, the States Division and Ministry of Foreign Affairs started releasing special funds to different embassies who projected that they can do states promotion in their country, in their host country. Mm. Special funds were provided to those missions and embassies for bringing out uh, those connectivities into focus and uh, getting some results out of these initiatives. So that was the main job, I would say. There are other things which can be added, but this mm. is the main thinking mm -hmm. and main uh, stay of these this division, this new division. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, also, I just wanted to understand uh, what was the level of engagement with the foreign embassies and consulates uh, for this division? Uh, because ultimately, uh, for any, say, stakeholder in India that wants to maybe uh, bring in investment or trade opportunities, would yeah. need to interact with the nodal uh, kind of uh, entity here, which is the foreign embassy. So what was the foreign embassy's role and how did that kind of change uh, with the I, setting of this? Uh, I will give you an example. Suppose a foreign, suppose I in Indonesia would like to see a particular investment in food and management system, FMC, what they call it, yeah. uh, in India. There is a company which we have found which wants to invest in India. Now, this investment is to be done in a particular state. Correct. It is, I mean, India is, is somewhere in a state, in any one of the states. When this investment is to be done, the embassy will need to tie up with the local authorities in that particular state, uh, with the particular uh, chamber of commerce or uh, business leaders or the government uh, ministries in that particular state. Earlier, this work used to be left at the central, central government level. We will inform the Ministry of Industry or we'll inform the Chamber of Commerce, CII or FICI and leave it at that. It will then be taken forward by these uh, these organizations. But with the new change, it has become much more effective in reaching out to the people concerned on the ground and mm. then handhold this company, in this case, Indonesian company, to go to India, to go to a particular state, start setting up their business, uh, remove the teething problems for setting up a new business in that state. That has changed now. Right. You know, I think that's uh, quite fascinating and uh, something which uh, I guess even, you know, these local level stakeholders have been hoping for. Uh, yeah. And, you know, uh, the economic uh, imbalances you know, among states are there to see. So I guess this is a great opportunity, uh, you know, for them in specific. Uh, another interesting development, uh, you know, in uh, economic diplomacy uh, sphere is, you know, how India can maybe push forward some of its national level initiatives, you know, some of the most successful ones being Digital India, the Make in India, uh, even recently the Har Ghar Jal uh, program uh, that uh, the Honorable Prime Minister has, uh, you know, rolled out. Uh, and how can this be uh, leveraged to other like-minded partners in countries? So if there are some examples uh, on that front and what is the potential you see in this regard? Uh, all those domestic policies that we have initiated, whether it is Make in India or Atmanirbhar India, Atmanirbhar Bharat or whatever, these need to be dovetailed with the domestic governmental policies. Hmm. And here I will talk about Indonesia. Yeah. Uh, almost simultaneously, when we started this Atmanirbhar Bharat uh, initiative, Indonesia has been on a aggressive uh, path with their policy of industrialization for hmm. aims are almost the same. Basically, fundamentally, the aim is that both countries like Indonesia and India have almost missed the 20th century industrial revolution. Hmm. There are certain stages which we have fallen behind. And if we can take a leapfrog and get into the 21st century industrialization process, 
skipping the 20th century, some of those 20th century uh, developments, we can catch up with the world. And we have this platform ready, whether you talk of uh, um, e-currency uh, or you talk of artificial intelligence or uh, machine learning and things like this, where especially countries like ours, Indonesia and India are at the forefront. If we can bring that to the level of global community and take a lead in these areas, we would have kind of compensated for our loss of time and loss of uh, industrial growth in the 20th century. Indonesia, the government of Indonesia has the same thinking. And with that in mind, they have launched this industrial four uh, mm. government policy. We need to dovetail, and this is what we have been talking whenever we talk to the government of Indonesia, that we need to bring our own strengths on the table and see how we can join hands with each other to further our progress, the rate of progress of economic development. One other example that I can give you in this regard is uh, cooperation in the field of solar energy. Uh, renewable energy sources, and I particularly emphasize on solar energy, though I will uh, have something else to say on renewable energies later, because uh, we have one of our Indian companies have taken a project in bio biogas uh, electrification project in a big way and similar things. But coming back to solar energy, uh, we have been telling uh, government of Indonesia to join the International Solar Alliance since the inception of ISA program. Indonesia has been rather uh, slow in responding in the beginning, primarily because I would say their emph emphasis on fossil fuel. They have a huge store of fossil fuel and their government energy agency did not want to downgrade their investment in fossil fuel in a way. But as the time goes by and as the realization of meeting the COP norms, COP Paris norms uh, sink in, there is an increasing tendency in Indonesia to emphasize on wider and um, higher utilization of solar energy in their energy mix. And we have found recently that government of Indonesia is quite receptive to the idea of taking the benefit of joining the solar uh, alliance, international solar alliance. And hopefully things will move uh, in this direction. OK. Uh, no, it's on the question of uh, solar, because that's, again, of an area of cooperation between both countries, as you pointed out. Uh, so maybe if, uh, if, if, are there opportunities for the embassy, for instance, to maybe uh, provide a platform for startups, Indian startups and companies to, you know, maybe exchange their knowledge and expertise, uh, even, you know, technical uh, knowledge in this sphere. So is, is, is there something the embassy can do in this regard? Embassy in this particular case can only advertise, be a springboard of, for advertisement of the Idea. individualities and mm -hmm. ideas, which I have been doing not only at the central level, but as I said, I have been meeting different provinces, governors and, and people like that, because at the here also the projects have to come in a particular province and the governors have a large role to play. So yeah. I have been giving them this information about the Indian strength in solar energy. And I have been telling them that whenever they think of a solar project, they must inform us, the Indian embassy, so that we can bring them in touch with the stakeholders and large players in India who can do that job, job for them. Hmm. Um, this has been a repetitive uh, exercise, um, as I said, both at the central hmm. level at the provinces level, mm -hmm. um, we have uh, not succeeded as yet in the last six months in getting any particular project in the solar field area. Mm -hmm. But I'm quite hopeful uh, because this all depends on government uh, proposals. Uh, solar energy is still a field here which is not uh, in the private hands. It mm -hmm. has to be done through the government. 
and unless the government issues a tender for a particular project or agrees for a particular project uh, no company or no uh, there is there is no opportunity otherwise so in a way i have uh, taken up the initial step and we are waiting for responses from the government of indonesia and provincial governments just to add to this there are a large number of india owned indians owned or india related companies in uh, indonesia and quite a large number of them have already started solar electrification of their manufacturing plants uh so there are certain examples of indorama plant or or machine building plants or other companies which have started electrification of their own plants in uh in indonesia i was the other day a couple of months ago i was in sumatra and there i went to a gloves manufacturing facility mm. which is asia's largest gloves uh, surgical gloves manufacturing facility owned by an indian company there they have set up already their solar uh, panel uh, solar electrification plant and it's running pretty well great no no i think that's uh, again a very interesting uh, you know dimension and uh, you're still kind of early days uh, you know in your stint uh, at at indonesia so we are hopeful for more uh, you know efforts and initiatives on that front uh, so you mentioned about the city provincial governments and this is again something which Uh, we try to explore in our work uh, you know looking at para diplomacy efforts uh, between city between cities uh, and uh, the embassy and even you know other stakeholders so i yeah. just wanted to understand uh, given that the concentration of economic and cultural influence have been in the cities you know in uh, this century in particular uh, but even maybe uh, further back uh, so i just wanted to understand uh, what are some of the special initiatives that the embassy organizes with the city uh, level or provincial level governments uh you know which will help implement projects for instance yeah um there are certain indonesian cities which have uh, uh sister city arrangements with indian cities like vijayawada uttarakhand katak um embassy is actively engaged in promoting the venues of increasing connect between two states or two cities this mostly is for a from a point of view of people to people interaction mm. tourism promotion promotion of uh, ideas and and as you mentioned about young people exchange of young people mm. also there is um, a very good uh, possibility of uh, enhancing our own tourist circles circuits like ramayana circuit like buddhist circuits there is also a special area of tourism these days of medical tourism uh, india's medical facilities are extremely well known and highly rated in indonesia so all these are being taken as uh, um guidelines on to which country should have sister relationship with which country in india which province should be connected with which province in uh in india uh so i would say that we have done quite some basic work but as everyone can appreciate these are never ending procedures and uh, uttarakhand is a good example where we have got um sister city status with uh, uh bali island yeah and and uh, we hope that after this covid period ends uh, there will be uh, a much more effective exchange of people and ideas no absolutely i think uh, again tourism is a sector which uh, has always been uh, at the forefront when it comes to india indonesia relationships and uh, again i think cities are going to be very important in the in this dialogue going forward yeah. Yeah. um i just also wanted to ask you ambassador uh, with regard to you know the study and understanding so how do you foster the study and understanding of india say amongst the indonesian public so what are some of those uh, efforts that the embassy can maybe uh, spearhead uh, so maybe some a little bit on that yeah uh, in fact study in india and training opportunities in india 
is one of the most vibrant features of our bilateral relationship. Um, we have uh, uh, some special uh, arrangements with ASEAN countries in general and Indonesia in particular. One of those uh, uh, recent ideas which was promoted by Prime Minister Modi was a doctoral fellowship in India by ASEAN countries. 1,000 scholarships were provided to ASEAN countries for getting higher level master's degree and PhD level expertise in one of India's 23 IITs. And if you see population wise, Indonesian population is almost half of ASEAN's population. So nearly 500 odd scholarships under this doctoral fellowship in India is available to Indonesian citizens. Right. Similarly, there is a program called Study in India program under which uh, uh, different universities offer from 25% to 100% scholarship for students from Indonesia for studies in India at undergraduate, postgraduate and uh, PhD level uh, studies. Uh, these can be in different fields, not only limited to engineering, but business, commerce, uh, humanities, law, management, etc. The third area of study for young people in Indonesia is in the area of culture, which there are about 22 scholarships provided by ICCR, Indian Council for Cultural Relations. Mm -hmm. And these are extremely popular in Indonesia. But more than these study courses, as I mentioned in the beginning, we have an, a good uh, opportunity for training in India, training of young professionals who between the age group of 25 to 45 years and those who have done five years of professional working in any field. These are called ITEC scholarship programs, Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation, under which um, as you perhaps know, India has been on this program since 1964 and billions of dollars have already been spent on this. Uh, we have about 40 scholarships available for Indonesian citizens every year. Uh, and um, uh, we have seen that there is um, not much information available on these scholarships to Indonesian uh, working professionals. And we have been trying to spread this word. As I said, whenever I go and meet with anyone, uh, either in center or in provinces, I always give them a brochure and inform them that this scholarship is available. Yeah. And I must say, only within the six months itself, we have started filling up the entire number of slots and getting more people to apply for these scholarships. Uh, these ITIC scholarships are extremely valuable because uh, once a candidate is selected from Indonesia, he or she does not have to spend even one penny because international travel in those days, in normal days time, tuition fee, lodging and boarding charges, everything is covered under this scholarship. Even within the COVID times, we have started having ITIC courses on uh, virtual mode. And I uh, have been told that these these uh, courses are running very well. People are still um, quite uh, satisfied with these training courses. One thing I like to add under ITEC program, perhaps you know, there is a concept of solar mamas. I don't know whether they have heard or not. Oh, no, not aware. Rural ladies, ladies in the deep rural areas are picked up to be sent to India where they learn how to set up uh, solar electric panels in their villages. Mm -hmm. Only after 15 days of training, these ladies are sent back to their villages. Mm -hmm. These kits for solar panels are sent to them. Mm -hmm. And these ladies who are sometimes, most of the times, absolutely illiterate. Because they have been trained in this, they set up these solar panels in their villages and teach other people how to work on these solar panels and how to set up, manufacture and set up these solar panels. This has also been started in Indonesia. This project is named as Solar Mamas. Mamas, 
yeah oh very interesting and uh, like you mentioned capacity building initiatives uh, have been a major dimension of the india indonesia relations if i could also add the tcs of colombo plan scholarships yeah, are also uh, introduced uh, and again indonesia is a is a large recipient of the itech uh, program uh, that yeah. you had just uh, you know very very eloquently pointed out with with that example uh, so thanks for that uh, i just wanted to now uh, shift our focus to how maybe the indian businesses uh, who want to set up uh, you know their operations in indonesia so uh, so i think recently there was an mou that was signed between the indonesian chamber of commerce and industry and the cii uh, including a cii office being set up in jakarta for this purpose so how has been the facilitation of uh, indian businesses coming into indonesia and uh, the embassy kind of taking a leading role on that front uh cii office was set up almost uh, just uh, before the covid period set in i am told that cii office uh, was started in january 2020 so the cii representative has not got that uh, advantage of working in complete freedom and open space though they have set up a good rapport with the indonesian chamber of commerce which is called uh, kadin um, and a large number of business related seminars and activities have been initiated by them hmm. but i must say i am not really satisfied also because of this particular situation that we are in hmm. there could have been more vibrancy in the in the activities of uh, uh, cii and kadin uh, kadin interactions indian companies are always welcome and we have been telling them that uh, we are here to help them and hold their hand um in their initial days in indonesia we have a few examples of uh, uh, initiatives taken in the field of pharmaceutical uh, where uh, uh, covid related drugs have been um, licensed to the indian companies and these companies have started tying up with uh, uh, indonesian counterparts um similarly there are some other uh, interaction as i had told you earlier about an indian company coming into the uh, biomass uh, biogas uh, electrification. Uh, electrification program so these are some of the success stories there is also another uh, area gmr has entered into a tender process for uh, um, for creation of a new airport in sumatra island these are still initial days but we have helped them extensively in uh, getting uh, to the uh, business leaders and uh, especially when i had gone to meet with the governor of sumatra i had taken this representative of gmr with me he had a first hand interaction with the governor which helped him a lot in finally getting to know about uh, this tender and getting to this stage where they are about to put this rfp um so i would say uh, the pandemic has stunted our desired growth in this area but we are still at it and we welcome any indian company either startup or a fully based company um to indonesia i don't know whether you are aware companies like gojek the transport company in indonesia is primarily uh, uh, an indian it related uh, investment hmm. and uh, similar stories are there in other areas of uh, high te high technology and machine learning business yeah and uh, you know and as you pointed out i think uh, the covid-19 pandemic has stunted uh, development on this front uh, but i think the in, in the indonesian um, uh, or in fact the indian investment in indonesia has has you know fairly has done fairly uh, well uh, in in recent yeah. years uh, according to latest figures i have with me there's roughly around uh, uh, 995.18 uh, million us dollars right across yeah. a lot of projects uh, and also a lot of joint venture firms between uh, right. indonesian and indian entities so i right. think that encouraging uh, as we move forward uh, yeah. now i want to just talk about uh, you know another cooperation uh, area right uh, which is on the infrastructure development uh, which i um which is also again something which was discussed in the recent uh, foreign policy consultation with between india and indonesia yeah. uh, 
so uh, is there a recognition that you know while the trade relationship you know as and you know indonesia is the second largest trade partner uh, in in asean of india's and the trade has increased in fact from 4.3 billion us dollars in 2005 to roughly 20 21 us bill, uh, billion us dollars in 2018 to 19 so is there a recognition that while the trade relationships have kind of uh, uh, you know uh, ballooned over the years maybe the infrastructure aspect uh, needs greater attention Uh, mm-hmm. so how does the embassy kind of coordinate with uh, and i know that you had recently met with some of the ministries in indonesia uh, regarding development projects so a little bit on the infrastructure and connectivity projects uh, between yeah. the two countries okay. now let me start with some kind of a background mm-hmm. uh, there is an india indonesia infrastructure forum uh, mm-hmm. which is aimed at enhancing indian investment in infrastructure sector in indonesia mm-hmm. um two editions of this forum were held in 2018 and 19 which saw participation of nearly 30 indian companies the ceos of indian companies in the areas of port development power airport water resources management hospital management system and health services industry 04 uh, and it solutions for infrastructure projects leading indian companies like as i mentioned earlier gmr gvk bhel adani tata power tcs tech mahindra adani vapcos exim bank jet airways amongst uh, other companies had participated in these uh, infrastructure forum um to add to these initiators as you would remember there is a line of credit of 1 billion dollar extended by government of india to asean countries for development of infrastructure infrastructure projects and we have given these facts to the government of indonesia that any infrastructure related project can be covered under this line of credit this these are very important uh, elements of development of infrastructure projects um we had signed an mou on technical cooperation in railway sector when prime minister modi had visited indonesia in may 2018 um we still have to utilize this particular mou because more work needs to be done but uh, on the air services sector a lot of uh, work need is awaiting the end of this pandemic period because mm. earlier there used to be a direct air india flights between india and indonesia which mm. were withdrawn about 10 12 years ago but we had uh, air asia batik air jet airways operating between bali and indian cities which also were stopped sometime earlier mm. nowadays just before the pandemic stuck air india and indigo had announced their destinations in uh, in bali and jakarta in the last quarter of 2019 hmm. but due to this pandemic this has been uh, not possible to be initiated but i am told that uh, we are especially uh, indigo and tata vistara have been designated as india's scheduled carriers to operate this air services agreement that we have and as soon as this covid situation improves i as i had mentioned to you i had met with the tourism minister earlier and we had uh, decided that the first instance when this thing um, permits the situation permits we will start the air linkages between bali and india and jakarta and india basically the indonesian idea is to restart bali as the tourism uh, hub and india was uh, quite keen to join hands with them so some of these things are uh, directly on infrastructure development we can also tell you that there has been a lot of discussion between infrastructure linkage Uh, between Andaman and Nicobar Island and Aceh Province, which is the northernmost tip of Indonesia, and many people do not realize 
the southernmost tip of india in nicobar island and the northernmost tip of indonesia in aceh are only 193 kilometers apart oh. 193 kilometers apart if you take a speed boat you can reach in 3 hours time <laughs> we need to develop this linkage and we have had uh, quite a, a number of discussions in this area um i can give you this figure that during the visit of prime minister of india in may 18 a joint task force jtf was set up between the two countries on development of connectivity between arche and andaman and nicobar island hmm. and uh, this uh, um, once again got derailed because of this covid situation in the last one and a half years first in india and now in indonesia but we hope that uh some concrete steps will be taken up very soon to uh, invigorate energy into this project of connectivity between arche province and andaman and nicobar province oh again fascinating and that's something which i wasn't aware of and uh, and we hope that there could be more a uh, kind of cooperation on the infrastructure connectivity front uh, uh, although the discussions were primarily on railways and the air connectivity sectors i think it's very relevant for maritime uh, connectivity as well uh, to kind of come up so so uh, about that i'll kind of move to that final segment uh, you know of this conversation and you know maybe we can touch upon uh, you know how the youth uh, are in fact quite uh, relevant to the conversation uh, in in the kind of diplomatic uh, relationship between both the countries given that you know the highest mobile internet use in the world is uh, within this region Uh, so how do you think both countries can leverage you know their respective demographic dividend and the digital revolution right uh, that we are currently uh, uh, that that's currently underway uh, and uh, if i could give an example of the indian asean youth summit uh, which has been uh, going on for the last few years so um, what are the ways in which do you think the embassy can promote such you know youth exchanges and engagements and as you had pointed out in your earlier remarks Uh, this is something which you are kind of deeply passionate about right uh, yeah. so yeah it would be lovely to hear what uh, your thoughts are on this one yes as you said i am quite passionate on this subject and i'll start with some passionate appeal the youth in india and indonesia both have to realize the uniqueness of our countries yeah and i'll start with some of them india is the world's largest democracy in in indonesia is world's third largest democracy india is the world's second most populous country <coughs> indonesia is world's fourth most populous country in real economic terms india is the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world indonesia is the ninth largest economy in the world we share the same diplomatic uh, sorry same democratic credentials we both emphasize on freedom of press we both emphasize on human rights uh, activities we both are similar countries there is a need particularly forget about politicians and diplomats <laughs> there is a need amongst the youth to realize these similarities there is a need for them to work on these similarities set up links on their own private channel today embassies and governments do not need to come in picture they are, they can be on social media with each other create social media forums create this awareness as to what is the role that the youth of india and indonesia can play in safeguarding the norm of democracy in the world today if you see everywhere the concept of democracy is being degraded starting from the us itself in the last 4 years you have seen how democracy democratic norms have been degraded the whole world is losing faith in democracy as a system to rule it is the youth of our two countries world's biggest democracy and the world's third biggest democracy to come together and spread this uh, message that the democratic system is the best system to rule over people the autocratic system or the communist systems are too too much degenerated on its own where particular freedoms are barred uh, uh, from a common access 
I'm as I use, as you mentioned and I said earlier, I'm quite passionate about this, and I see a large role being played by the youth of these two countries in coming days. Take the help of social media and build this connectivity between you two. Forget about air connectivity or rail connectivity or maritime connectivity. It is your connectivity which is of significance today for the upkeep of not only our two countries, but democracy at large in this world. Now, as far as the role of Indian embassy is concerned, embassy is always open for any new initiative that one can suggest. Any way to bring the people of two countries together, I can assure you, I will take personal interest in uh, taking these proposals forward and working with you on this side of the spectrum. And the Indian side, I will leave it to the youth of India. Right. No, I think, uh, again, it's very uh, touching to know that, uh, you know, the youth needs to be seen uh, as a very important constituent uh, as we as we move forward. And uh, I think uh, your efforts on that front uh, will certainly be welcome you know, in the in the years to come. Uh, so maybe, uh, you know, maybe one final uh, message you have for say Indians who uh, look towards Indonesia, both from a tourism standpoint, from educational standpoint, setting up businesses, what would be your, you know, one or two key takeaways uh, for, for them as they look towards this country? I'm also a product of Indian education system. And though I'm an engineer, but I have a deep, uh, deep uh, interest in history and geography and things like that. And this is the message I want to give to the Indian youth. Indian books in the schools or colleges do not give the due importance to Indonesia as a country. Yeah. The youth of India must do their own research to find how Indonesia is a very near and dear country for Indians. Mm -hmm. It has always been a country of our ancestors. It has been a country where we had deep and direct relationship since the beginning of civilization, almost the beginning of civilization, starting from 3rd century BC, at least. And the youth of today do not know about these linkages. My suggestion and my advice to the youth of India and the listeners of this program will be study our history, study our relationship with Indonesia. And you will be fascinated to see what has happened in the past. That will also give you enough encouragement to get up and start working more for the future of not only India and Indonesia individually, but for our bilateral relationship as well. Thank you. No, wonderful to hear. And I think uh, maybe we can have another round of conversation, maybe on the geographic and historical and cultural ties between both the countries, because clearly you seem to be passionate about uh, furthering this uh, initiative as well. Uh, but Ambassador uh, uh, Bhati, thank you so much uh, you know, for joining us and sharing your fascinating insights. It was really a pleasure uh, speaking with you. You're most welcome. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much. And for all those who joined in, uh, you know, uh, thanks again uh, for tuning into this program. Uh, you know, for our upcoming episodes, you can watch uh, out this space for more updates because we'll be coming back next week with another episode. So you can subscribe to The Bridge Project uh, on across various social media platforms, wherever you listen to your podcast. So this will be available in those podcast applications. Uh, so uh, maybe I can leave it at that. So thank you, Ambassador Bharti. It was uh, a pleasure. And thank you yeah. so much. And we wish uh, you and your team all the very best, uh, given the grim thank situation you, in Indonesia now. So thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. All the viewers, bye-bye.